Welcome once again to Living Hope, our living, breathing weekly show where we take a look at the real stories of real people really dealing with this deadly disease, pancreatic cancer, sharing their stories of how they deal with it on a daily basis. The two women who've talked about this once or twice before, I think, I'm going to take a guess. What do you say, Roberta Luna? a few times actually we're very excited and honored today to have kitty swink as our guest today thank you kitty for coming kitty is a television guest star often appearing and i like this part as a smart ass judge i like the smart ass part i think i can really relate to that a wise doctor or shark of a lawyer sci-fi fans know her from star trek at deep space nine and babylonian five Kitty is an 18-year pancreatic cancer survivor, proud ambassador of the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, and also something that maybe a lot of you don't know is Kitty is also a breast cancer survivor. So thank you, Kitty, for joining us today. We're really thrilled to have you on today. Thank you. I'm so thrilled, and I'm always happy to be with you, Roberta. It makes me joyful to see you every time. Thank you. I wish everybody felt that way, but... (laughs) Thank you. I, I greatly appreciate it. Can I jump today. back in one second there, Roberta? I want you to correct you because you're not obviously a science fiction fan. You said Babylonian 5. It's Babylon 5. Sorry, and you know what? I hate to admit it, but I've never watched the Star Trek. <laughs> and I promise I will. Oh, my goodness. Because my, my sons are actually big fans. Especially I am a huge son. fan here. I, it's a big honor to have anybody associated with a great franchise in here today. I just had to correct that because people are going to write in and say it's Babylon 5 here. Well, there you go. That that gives me away, right? I can't try to hide anything. (laughs) But I will catch up. I will start watching, I promise. It's just something that, you know, I just never got into. But like I said, my my sons have been doing it. Um, Now to get back (laughs) to why we're here today. Okay. Thank you, Paul. He really is really good about throwing me under the bus about different I, things. I had to do it, Roberta. You know, once in a while we have to show your other no, side here. I really here. appreciate it. Thank <laughs> you. So can you just share with us how your journey began with pancreatic cancer? It was a particularly difficult time in my life. My, we had all been dealing with my father's Alzheimer's, and he wouldn't quit driving, and he couldn't really take care of himself. And a lot going on, and our friend Cecily Adams, who people who are Star Trek fans, but no, uh, because she played Moogie on Deep Space Nine, and she was dying of lung cancer and had a two-year-old and had never really been a smoker, but so it was a lot of stress, and I was suing to become my father's guardian, and I just kept losing weight, and I felt out of shape, and anybody who's ever met me, Roberta will let you know that I'm pretty wiry, and I just, it's weird when I lose weight because I'm not very big to begin with. I'm tall, but I'm not big, so... I kept losing weight and I didn't feel right, but I just thought it was all the stress I was under. And um, Armin, my husband and I were doing Hamlet and I was gonna go off and shoot something in New Orleans. And I just started feeling worse and worse and worse and worse. And there was uh, a weekend, I had stopped working out. I I never don't work out. Through chemo, if I wasn't a Japhenic, I worked out. It's how I keep myself from killing people. (laughs) I think I'm nice, but really. (laughs) I'm a cranky pants. Okay, so I admit it. I'm a cranky pants. So I stopped working out, and a friend of ours, son tragically committed suicide, and we went. I went to. I went to see Cecily in the hospital on a Thursday. Her nanny from her childhood said, "Don't worry about her. You should worry about yourself." And I came home and said something to Armin about it, and he said, "Maybe you should. You've lost a lot of weight." So I called my doctor, and I said, "We'll get you in next week." On front, this is a long story. I'm so sorry. On Friday, yeah. called and said, "We can get you in right now." They never do that. So I said, "Okay, I'm coming in." And my my physician, who had also said, "You know, you're not a complainer. Maybe you should check." When I had breast cancer, said this again, and she said, "Well, let's just take a blood test. You probably just have acid reflux because of all this stuff, but maybe it's something else." So we took a blood test over the weekend. Armin and I went to see a bunch of friends in a play and I went to the bathroom. We went to a bar afterwards and I went to the bathroom and my urine had turned brown, which is crazy. And I called my doctor and left a message. And on Monday we went to the funeral for this friend of our son who had tragically committed suicide. And while I was there, my doctor left a message on our home phone saying, you need to go to the hospital right now. Your liver and your kidneys are shutting down. And I got home and I heard that message and I was like, what? Uh, But so I called the doctor and it was after the event at the wake. It was after the um, office had closed. 
And the doctor on call said, oh, I don't really see anything in the notes. So I think you're okay until tomorrow. And then about an hour later, I laid down because I really didn't feel good. And about an hour later, uh, my doctor, uh, Alice Cruz, called and said, go to Cedars right now. They're expecting you in the emergency room. Go. And while we were sitting waiting in the emergency room, I turned yellow. At about 11 o'clock that night, they took me in. And about 5 o'clock in the morning, Moses Fallis, who had been my surgeon when I had breast cancer, came in and said, we're going to do some tests. We're not friends anymore. I'm your doctor. You're my patient. We'll be friends again. 17 days later, I came out of Cedar sinai having had a whipple. And two and a half weeks after that, I started chemo, which was sort of a land speed record in those days, I think. And I feel like I'm the luckiest girl in the world. They came out at one point and said, we think we have to close her up. We don't think we can get to it. And the tumor bubbled up and they were able to take it. And here I am. I am so, so lucky. So lucky. Yes. And I'm so thrilled that your doctor called and told you not to wait. I mean, that's um, something that, you know, when you have this kind of diagnosis, even thinking about you, we can't wait. We don't have that kind of time like you might have with other cancers, maybe you have that, but unfortunately with pancreatic, you don't. So I'm very glad that your doctor called you and took it upon herself to tell you to go in. And I'm sorry you had to deal with so much all at one time. I mean, you know, visiting your friend in the hospital and the, you know, a funeral and your dad and then your diagnosis. It's like that, that true thing they say when it rains, it pours. I'm sure you must have really felt that, right? Yeah, well, there's a quote from Hamlet when they come not in single spies, but in battalions. And I think that's what it felt like. I felt like the whole army was marching down on me. When I was in surgery, Cecily, who had been a, who had visited in the hospital, died. And Armin wouldn't let anybody tell me that until I was sort of through the other side. And the day I came home from the hospital, Armin went and spoke at her funeral. It was a very difficult time. Um, there are often difficult times in our lives, but there's also great times in our lives. And that's sort of how I try and get through life is concentrating on the great times. As cranky as I am right in this moment, when we have great times. I, I have to say, because I've had people tell me it's something similar. I'm kind of like that. I apparently, I guess at times, so maybe that's the crankiness. Maybe that's why we're the survivors, you know? Um, <laughs> I've had people, the good Lord don't know what to do with you and the devil don't want you. So we can keep it that way for a very long time. And maybe it is the crankiness. So stay cranky. If that's okay. it, you know, stay cranky. <laughs> when you were diagnosed with, with breast cancer and then being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, did you ever thought about, think about death? Or it, maybe that's why, you know, Armin didn't want to tell you about her. She was, he was afraid that maybe you would lose hope or... When I had breast, I had such an easy case of they caught my breast cancer so early. It was a DCIS. I had surgery, one and done. But pancreatic cancer, I had a, some really dark nights of the soul. That is why he didn't want me to be told. Also, the first thing I said when I came to in intensive care is how Cecily. He didn't want to scare me. He didn't want to scare me. He wanted me to have my game face on. And pretty much I did. I mean, I. I don't know about you, Roberta, but I had some terrible nights, sobbing bad nights. But but then I would kind of, I realized, I went to get a second opinion from a, a very famous, who shall, who shall remain nameless, uh, pancreatic cancer doctor. And he said, well, who did your whipple? And I told him, and who did this? And I told him, and he said, well, you didn't get good care. You're going to die. And I got up. And I said, honey, we're leaving. I'm not interested in working with somebody who's not on my team. And at that moment, I went, I have things to do. I'm not ready to leave this planet now. And I'm just going to survive. And that's, uh, I, I don't know for how long, but I'm going to survive. And I'm going to be alive when I'm alive. And so that's what I did. That's what I did. Well, I think when we go off air, we're going to have to compare notes because that sounds like the doctor I had who actually told me I was not going to survive and he did not take my case, but <laughs> I don't want to call anybody out. Yeah. And it wasn't the first time, even when I got the diagnosis from my doctor, because he knew my family history. He knew I'd lost three family members at that time and told me, you know, no one survives this um, disease, but we'll start treatment right away. And we started chemo the following week, which was very quick as well. Sometimes I think, you know, the doctor, when he told me to go home and put my affairs in order, 
it made me mad, but at the same time, it made me mad in a way that, yes, I agree, I needed to get my affairs in order, but it also made me decide, I'm going to fight because I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm going <laughs> to I don't like to be told for one what to do. So it was, maybe it was the best thing he ever said to me was to go home and put my house in order, even though it made me upset. But with your diagnosis with breast cancer before the pancreatic, did that impact your outlook and your mood and decision making and fighting pancreatic cancer? Did it have anything to do with it at all? Sort of, especially because even though genetic testing wasn't that done in those days, my father's mother had had breast cancer and had survived. She had had a double mastectomy, but survived. And then she was a diabetic. So I began to think this is a family issue. Like you, it's a family issue. Nobody that I know of had had pancreatic cancer besides me. But since we know there's a link between diabetes and, and pancreatic cancer and and uh, breast cancer runs in our family, I thought, well, this is a problem. So maybe, yeah, yeah, it did maybe affect my decision-making, but mostly really what I think it did, in every tragedy, there's a gift, in my opinion. Well, maybe not in Ukraine, but in most tragedies, there's a gift. And my gift was I wasn't going to be dead to anything anymore. I mean, emotionally dead. I was going to live... And I was going to be aggressive about getting treatment, but I was also going to seize the day. I was going to have, I was going to do something fun every day of my life. I was going to do something that educated me every day of my life. And I was going to try and do something that helped people every day of my life. And I don't always succeed at that, but I have for the 18 and a half years since then, I have worked really hard at those three things. Well, I don't know if you've done what you've done, but I know I do know you have inspired somebody every day of your life. So since you were diagnosed, so that is something you have accomplished. And, you know, it's funny, I think because we think we have all the time in the world and a lot of people make a bucket list or whatever you want to call it. And you're going to wait and do all these things because you have all the time. And it's kind of sad. I think when we get a diagnosis like this, we realize well, maybe we don't have all that time. I know I started doing things I said I was going to do. And I waited until getting a diagnosis one, you know, skydiving is something now that I, I love to do. And it's a yearly event. And we're going to get you out there, um, hopefully next year, even just to watch them if you don't want to jump. But you can come watch us and have a great time. <laughs> I'll, I'll come watch you because there was a girl on my my uh, floor my freshman year in college who took skydiving for her PE class fall term and broke her legs at the ankles. So I never... I have never wanted, and I'm pretty, I like ziplining. Yeah, man, I love it, but that scares me. But I'll watch you happily. <laughs> well, we'd love to have you. Like I said, we do it every year, and it's just, we add a new survivor every year, so maybe we'll be able to tuck you into it. But if not, we'd love to have you there. You said you, you know, you had the whipple. All this happened, like, within, a, it sounds like a, a very short time, a couple of weeks or so. You had the whipple followed by chemo. Can you explain to people who aren't aware of what the whipple is and what you went through? But they, they basically get you like a fish. The surgery is better now. Uh, and at that time, about 25% of the people died on the table. I, I think, and it's not that at all now, they took half my pancreas, my gallbladder, uh, half my stomach, and a couple feet of intestines and 28 lymph nodes out. So for the rest of your life, you have some, <laughs> you have some interesting digestive issues. I have to say I fart like Toby Belch, sorry world, but I do. And uh, it took me a long, long time. I was 5'10", I'm now 5'8", but I was 5'10", I become a diagnosis, and I got down to 90 pounds. Part of it was I couldn't digest food. I take medication every day of my life, every time I eat to digest food, because I can't do it for myself anymore, really. I have trouble with sugars and fats and all those things. And I remember one of the first people who called me, I'm probably through my first three rounds of chemo and into doing radiation for six weeks. And this guy called me because his wife knew us and he wasn't going to have a whipple because he wasn't going to live being not able to eat whatever he wanted. And I said, you're not going to live at all if you don't have the whipple probably. So have the whipple. You're operable. Most people aren't lucky enough to be operable. And uh, he refused to do it and got sicker. And he went the Steve Jobs route and uh, he got sicker and sicker. And then he tried to have a whipple. And sadly, it was too late. And he didn't, so, you know, some people are miraculous and survive going from trial to trial, but that doesn't happen very often. And 
he had a short, sad, painful trip through pancreatic cancer. So whatever the cost of the Whipple is, it's worth the price. It's absolutely worth the price if you can have it. Yeah, and unfortunately, I'm one of those unlucky ones who haven't been able to have it, but maybe at some point in time, I mean, you know, the tumor is dormant for whatever reason, and we're happy with that. We'll let the sleeping giant lay, whatever he wants to do. And I, I truly believe in time, they will come up with something because I've seen so many changes when I was first diagnosed and others who were in similar circumstances, they didn't survive because it was inoperable. And I'm still here and I've seen the changes that surgery has made and hopefully you know they will find something and my tumor will stop being kind of stubborn and move away from the artery instead of more into it so we can get it out of there but for now it's it's fine and but i agree if you can if there's something you can do do it because life is so precious and it doesn't just affect us it affects our families as well and you know think about who you're leaving behind and what they will be going through so it's a family disease if there's no question it's everybody in the family is involved you're right and Vic says that all the time it doesn't just affect the patient it affects the whole family and you have to look at it that way and i've heard people say that the wibble is kind of like replumbing your insides <laughs> so i don't know if you can uh, you know attest to that as well but did you and you did say that you are taking i assume pancreatic enzymes is that what you're taking yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. so and are you a diabetic did they take enough of your um, pancreas out that that's made you a diabetic or no okay. I've been skating on the edge of pre-diabetic for quite a while. So I, I watch, well, I don't always watch what I eat, but I mostly watch what I eat. Luckily, I haven't flipped over, but I assume at some point I will. I assume at some point I will. So, you know, as much as I would happily eat two pounds of cherries at a sitting, I don't do that much anymore. You know? Yeah. And it does, the Whipple is like re-plumbing you. I remember more than once getting up, really fast when I could first really get up fast again and feeling things move, moving around inside. It's really weird. It's it's weird. It's yeah, that's what I've heard. Like I said, I haven't been able to do that, but I've heard that from many people. And I can't attest to the farting issue, but I can attest to the burping. I am a big burper. <laughs> and apparently they've tied it in somehow with the tumor. I'm not sure how that works, but, um, you know, I'll use any excuse I guess I can when it happens. So <laughs> well, we, can, we can be a whole rhythm section together. There right? you go. We can start our own band, right? But you did mention that I guess you have had to make some lifelong changes since the Whipple with diet. Is there anything like exercise? Has, have you been able to go back to what you normally did or has that changed as well? I, I, n- I never really stopped exercise. I mean, I have stopped some, like I don't run anymore, but not because of the Whipple. And after the Whipple, right before my 60th birthday, I think, right before my 60th birthday, I was asked to run up for the Miller Family Foundation, which does extraordinary things, particularly the City of Hope in terms of patient services, asked me to join their half marathon, the LA Rock and Roll Half Marathon, mm-hmm. so that's seven years ago. And I hadn't run, I'd been hiking, but I hadn't run. And I thought, well, I can do that. So I turned up and ran the marathon, half marathon with them. I had been a long distance runner for a long time, but I still lift weights. I still hike. In fact, uh, one of the things that I'm seizing the day with is six of us are going to walk the entire Cumbrian Way this fall, which is quite a hike in the Lake District of England. Uh, we'll, we'll walk about 10 miles a day for eight days, a little over 10 miles a day for eight days. For the backpack on our back while somebody moves our luggage, and that just seems like heaven to me. So yes, I can do pretty much, except for, you know, like bad knees and I did too many stupid athletic things when I was young, I can pretty much do any exercise I want. No, good. That's good when you, you know, it's important for people to understand that, you know, this may change our lives, but we can still have good productive lives and, you know, it doesn't have to end there. So I'm glad you're able to end. (laughs) I never want to put anything off on age, but you know what, I guess I I will use any excuses I can too. So (laughs) it's good that you are able and I'm, I'm happy to hear that. You're in obviously the entertainment industry and how did they deal with your diagnosis? Or did you, I assume you had to do somewhat public, let people know. It was sort of weirdly public because Melissa Gilbert was president of Screen Actors Guild and I had at one time been a vice president of the union. And Melissa somehow let it out to the membership. And I have to say my my room really looked like a florist shop. And the nurse's station got a lot of flowers and 
treats and cookies and stuff. I mean, it was, I was really supported. The problem was I had thought I was going to go shoot a pilot in New Orleans and that didn't happen. And I hadn't really been looking for television work leading up to getting sick because I knew I had this job coming up and I was playing Gertrude in Hamlet and my husband Armin was playing Claudius. So I was concentrating on that because I had a new, you know, I had a job coming up. It was really fun to do Hamlet with Armin, but I, so that was great. When I first finished treatment and I looked really terrible, I mean, I looked really terrible. I'd lost about a third of my hair and I was emaciated. Several people just really showed up and gave me jobs. So because it helped me keep my insurance. I mean, I was covered by Armin's insurance, but when you're talking about these kind of bills, having double coverage was really helpful. And so CSI just gave me a job and judging Amy gave me a job and uh, NYPD Blue gave me a job. It was, I mean, they knew me, so it was easier because I, you know, been in the industry a long time, but they were really helpful. And I have to say my Star Trek family was amazing. They were amazing and they are a family and Jonathan Frakes, who people know as number one as Riker on Next Generation and is one of the, and Picard and is one of the main directors in the Star Trek franchise, lost his brother to pancreatic cancer a few years before I was diagnosed. So, and he's a big supporter of uh, PanCan. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. And yes, uh, yeah, and so I can't say enough how having a support system helps you. I know that Vic is like Armin, he's just the best. And, and a lovely guy, and so is Armin, but having other friends around you really makes a big difference. You know, find community, find community. Yeah, it, it's, it is, it's great because you need that support, like you say, and having your spouse there behind you along with everybody else, it, it makes a big difference. So you're right, I'm very thankful for Vic, and I always wonder sometimes why he's still with me, because he's the saint of the group, the better, he truly is the better half of our working relationship here. So um, he's been awesome. And I'm glad you had that same support. I believe your oncologist gave your husband the best advice that I think I have heard. And I wish other doctors would do this. I know mine didn't, but I wish others would do this. And I'm sorry, I can't remember if it was a female now, but your doctor said, don't go online and look up the survival rate for pancreatic cancer. Your wife is not a statistic. She is a person. This is something we say constantly and are trying to drill into people's head. We're not statistics. We're people. We're real living, breathing people. And we need to do more than what's being done for pancreatic cancer. What advice would you give to somebody who just came up to you and said, I've just been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and I don't know what to do, what I should do. What would you tell them? I'd tell them to call PanCan right away. I because, I mean, that's the first thing I tell people. I tell them a lot of things. But the first thing I say is, they was called PanCan because they have patient services. They can talk to you about treatment. They can help you in so many ways. They can help your family in so many ways. So I think PanCan is a real resource that's like one-stop shopping for everything you need. That's one of the reasons why I support them. So financially, with my time, with my love, with my social media platform, with annoying my friends into doing all those things too. And the other thing is I'd say... Don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. Be here while you're here. We had a dear friend, Renee Bergenois, who died right before the pandemic of lung cancer. And he was a living, and he, in the end, uh, it had moved into his brain and he made the choice to take his own life, which he has every right to do in the state of California, and but had a peaceful, but every day he was alive, he made art. He spent time with the people that he loved. He found things uh, to do. And he spent a lot of time, much longer than anybody had anticipated, much longer than anybody had anticipated, living with treatment and doing really well. And I, he was an example for all of us about how to embrace life. Because we don't know if we're going to get hit by a car or get a bad case of COVID or be one of those kids in Uvalde, Texas. We just don't know what the world is going to bring to us. So while we're here, be here. And in the meantime, get the people who can help you to surround you and start working on it. That's what I would say. But PanCan, that's the first call. That is the very first call I would tell anybody to make. 
And I have to agree with you. That's always the first thing I do too, is to reach out get in touch with PanCan and they've been a great organization and I want to thank you for being here today and sharing your story. I'd love to have you come back because there's so much more I want to talk about with you. <laughs> Maybe next time we can even do it in person and you know but either way just whatever just would love to have you come back so thank you for taking that time and I really enjoyed seeing you and talking and you look great so keep up whatever you're doing and thank you for being the ambassador for Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. It's awesome. Pancreatic Cancer has taken a lot from me, but it's also given me some wonderful people in my life. And I consider you as one of them. You're a great inspiration. And I look to you. And at the end of every episode, we dedicate our show to somebody. And it's an, an African proverb that I ran across that says, as long as you speak my name, I shall live forever. And this episode, I'd really love to dedicate to an amazing woman who introduced us, Charlotte Ray. She was Mrs. Garrett on Facts of Life, and she was a great inspiration, a great support. And when I lost my mom, she stepped to the plate and said, I know she, I can never take her place, but I'm here if you need me. And she was a character, to say the least. And I feel very honored to have met her, and I'm very thankful for her to have introduced us. So. Thank you so much for being here. And Charlotte, we still thank you. We speak your name constantly and we love you. And thank you, Kitty. I love you dearly. And you are a great inspiration and a great theory of hope. So thank you. Thank you. And I thank you. Thank you. Thank you for asking me to be here. And here's to Charlotte. Yes. Thank you. Well, there you have it. Some more reasons that you should tune in each and every time to our show, Living Hope. A weekly journey designed to provide hope, inspiration, and education for those living with pancreatic cancer. Sharing the real-life stories of those really affected by this deadly disease and how they deal with it on a daily basis. If you'd like to share your own story, please contact us here at the station. Or if you know anyone who needs help, like right now, lots of resources. Let's start with PanCan. Call Patient Services at 877-2-PANCAN for the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. For the OC Talk Radio Network, I'm Paul Roberts, thanking you for joining us, hoping you'll share these stories with others and come back as we ride along on this journey we call Living Home.